Hi, this is Titus Welliver. You're listening to TV Confidential. Ed Robertson, along with our guest Patrick Kilpatrick. Patrick's career as a lead actor, producer, screenwriter, director, and global entertainment teacher spans more than 170 movies and TV shows. As an acting teacher, Patrick has received high praise from such luminaries as Joe Mantegna, Ron Perlman, and three-time Emmy Award winner James Woods. Volume 1 of Patrick's two-volume memoir, Dying for Living, Sins and Confessions of a Hollywood Villain and Liberty Patriot is available now in hardcover, paperback, and as an ebook through Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, wherever books are sold online. Volume 2 will be coming out later in 2019. If you're listening to us in the vicinity of Denver, Colorado, Patrick Kilpatrick will be appearing at the Tattered Cover Bookstore in Denver on Wednesday, August 28th. More information on these and other upcoming events, patrickkilpatrick.com. You can also follow Patrick on Twitter at I am Pat Kilpatrick, facebook.com forward slash I'm Pat Kilpatrick. Um, You mentioned in our previous segment, Patrick, that uh, every now and then established industry professionals and actors will drop by one of your workshops to observe what you're doing and maybe pick up pointers and and be open to learning new things. Uh, One of the uh, quotes in the back of your book, the one that made me jump, is James Woods says, one of only two people from whom I learned something about acting was Patrick Kilpatrick. We are all lucky that Patrick Kilpatrick has chosen to share his craft with others that's remarkable because I know that you worked with Woods in Shark a few years back. So that was after he had won his Emmys. So the fact that he, this is a three-time Emmy winner learning from you, that says a lot about him and it says a lot about you. Well, it was wonderful of him to say that. and It was completely unsolicited. Um, he just sent me an email about it when he found out I was teaching and writing the memoir, which I... You know, I'm very great. I really respect James a lot, and, and uh, it was pretty remarkable that he would say something like that. I know he enjoyed my work on Shark with him mm-hmm. a lot. I think the thing he was commenting on is specifically about that is I, um, I was injecting some musicality into this part that I was playing as a serial killer on mm-hmm. his show. Um, and I think he found that remark. Um, <laughs> very smart guy. He's really involved in every aspect of something when he works on it, and I really enjoyed working with him. Unfortunately, the political situation, which I also address in the book, um, has uh, isolated him some, somewhat from Hollywood because left Hollywood has a tendency to isolate and exclude anyone who doesn't have their liberal orthodoxy, all the while bitching about the blacklist and advocating for diversity. They're actually less than diverse in their intellectual thought. You gave us a glimpse of how you approach playing a villain, playing a serial killer, when you talked about your experience working on Shark with James Woods. And this is probably a loaded question, but let me ask it anyway. I understand that the key to playing a villain, even a heinous person like a serial killer, is not to think of them as such. What do you think of that, and how do you approach playing sick characters like that? No, I don't. Um, I, I don't think uh, what works for me a lot is a sort of psychosexual basis to their behavior. Every villain character is different, so you have to take a look at. Uh, the style of the script and the project or play or whatever it is and the moment in time that they're existing. Um, So each one is specific. But um, I've often tried to arouse people at the same time, scare them. One of the ways to do that for me has been to come up with sort of psychosexual imagery in my head uh, with the people that I'm dealing with. And so that that tends to put a glint in your eye and uh, to give you a, a certain um, soie de vivre, if you would, even as, as a villain. Now, there are other villains who are just banality themselves, 
uh, I'm thinking of uh, Robert Duvall played a villain in a, something called um, Citizen X. It was the most prolific serial killer in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And he really was banality itself. And so uh, that involves being really boring um, and, and being innocuous and invisible. Often you're doing the complete opposite of that, but in Citizen X, that was the place to be a, an invisible villain. You know, so often they say, oh, he just seemed like he was the guy next door. I was working with Mandy Potemkin one time on Criminal Minds, mm -hmm. and we were talking about serial killers, and, and he said something very, um, very insightful. He said, it's just a, a conversation. I mean, anybody can be a serial killer. <laughs> um, they, they don't all come out and go boo. No. I mean, there's usually some path that eventually leads them to that. Just as nothing happens in a vacuum, something happens that results and leads them to, to take that particular path. Yeah, there's a wonderful series of books called The Prey Novels, written by a guy named John Sanford. And he talks about, in some ways, it's somewhat like... Um, it, it, it's like a tiger or a, a, an animal that gets gets a taste for eating flesh. I think the same is true for someone who gets a taste for aberrant sexuality or a taste for pedophilia or those kind of things. They experience these things and it resonates with them. Yes, there's usually sexual abuse or abuse, physical violence, uh, in the histories of those people. But not across the board. There's no evidence that Ted Bundy was abused as a child. Yet he was one of the most horrific killers that has existed in American culture. And it goes back to how we started our conversation, Patrick. No matter what your background is, whether it was quote-unquote normal or not, it's up to us to take personal responsibility and decide, okay, are we going to let the past define us or are we going to, you know, chart our own course? Sure. I mean, uh, it's not thought that counts, it's behavior. If you, you could have thoughts of killing your neighbor, mm -hmm. but that doesn't make you a, uh, guilty of anything. That's right. The, imagine, the imagination can conjure up almost anything. Mm -hmm. It's whether you act on that. Um, I just, I've got a movie coming out called Catalyst where I play a, a pedophile priest. Mm -hmm. Very interesting reading the research on all of that because the, the disturbing thing about it is, or, and the remarkable thing is that the, the backgrounds, the origins of behavior like that, and uh, I, we'd all agree that pedophilia uh, by priests or otherwise is something to be reviled. But well, what's interesting about it is if you start researching it is you find that the origins and the motivations of it are uncomfortably close to the origins and motivations for almost all of the flaws that we have as human beings, yeah. whether it's smoking or promiscuity or drugs or overeating or whatever. So there, there comes a point where people vector off into these things and you either have control of it or you don't. On the line with us is Patrick Kilpatrick. Volume 1 of Patrick's memoir, Dying for Living, Sins and Confessions of a Hollywood Villain in Liberty Patriot, is a rollicking tale of Patrick's volatile yet privileged upbringing that includes nearly being stabbed to death by his own mother and witnessing her infidelity, plus a searing, often hilarious, and scandalous behind-the-scenes look at working with Hollywood's elite. Volume 1 of Dying for Living is available in hardcover, paperback, and as an ebook through Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, wherever books are sold online. Now, Volume 1 of Dying for Living is available now. Volume 2 will come out later in 2019, although you do give your readers a preview, a trailer, so to speak, of Volume yeah, 2. Yeah, a long, a long excerpt yeah. in Volume 1. And you share a few stories, just a few stories of your acting career. And one of the takeaways for me, it surprised me, and this dovetails in our conversation about approaching playing uh, heinous people, serial killers, villains of all kinds, is that you share a couple of stories 
of how you had to remind your acting partner in the scene that, okay, I'm going to approach this scene like this, and you have to remember this is the character, this is not me. And yet, you were so effective, you left your acting partner shaken. <laughs> that surprised me. Yeah, that's in this section of the book called The Rapist uh, Lament. Because mm-hmm. um, I've, I've been hired a couple of times to kidnap or, and uh, rape the... Um, the leading lady. The... The leading lady, yeah. Naomi Watts and Blythe Danner and um, Daphne Zuniga and stuff, and I think uh, I think it's a traumatic experience. E- even though physical contact is, doesn't occur, mm-hmm. uh, and there's no physical harm done, I think even mental and physical abuse it's trying for actors. And so, and when you create these. I mean, I've had the privilege of doing these people that are really kind of towering, uh, toweringly evil mm-hmm. um, and prob- and troubled. Um, I go at it, hammer and tong, yeah. and you have to. And as a consequence, um, it sometimes can interfere with the relationship off the camera. Yeah. Um, at, the, at least for a time. Uh, until people come down and go wherever they're going. But that's your job. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, again, Patrick, I'm not an actor, but two of my best friends here in L.A. are working actors. And whenever we talk about the process, they always go back to the word commitment. And as I understand, that is one of the things you do whenever you approach a role, and that's one of the things that you teach your students to break it down and focus on what you need to do and how you need to approach it and commit yourself to that performance. Yes. Yeah, well, you have to. And if you don't, you, then you are in danger of losing the impetus of the scene. Uh, a cautionary tale, I talk about Blind Danner and doing Streetcar and Desire. If you back off mm-hmm. uh, at, at Stanley, then you're not doing justice to the character of Stanley. Yeah. Um, uh, at the same time, being conscious of not doing physical harm uh, to anybody, or that's a breakdown in craft. Real quickly, you mentioned Daphne Zuniga, and you worked with her in the movie Stone Pillow. The Stone Pillow was the last screen role for Lucille Ball. It's been years since I've seen this movie. Did you have any scenes with Lucy? What was it like to work with Lucy? I didn't have any scenes with her. She was there on the set, and she was playing a bag lady. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just had... Uh, some opportunity to speak with her and to spend a little time with her, but I all my scenes were with Daphne, uh, so no, I didn't have the privilege of acting with her. Um, I've had some memorable experiences off camera with people like that, like with Vanessa Redgrave and sharing our affection for Tony Richardson on uh, Nip Talk, which she was on. But no, sometimes a lot of times you're on a movie and you don't act with. Like, I, I did Presidio with Meg Ryan, but mm-hmm. I didn't get a chance to act with her. Yeah. All my scenes were with Mark Harmon and Sean Connery. And there are a few stories of experiences with other actors, such as Pam Greer, which we will not talk about. We have to read the book in order to find out what we're talking about. Final question for now. We mentioned Nightwalk. We mentioned Catalyst. You have another film coming up called Active Shooter. What can you tell our listeners about Active Shooter? Active Shooter is a weird little creative enterprise. Um, I received a little bit of money, and we went out and shot using a lot of resources I had, uh, real SWAT teams and and uh, fire departments, and went around the country and shot a lot of ni- uh, naturalistic footage and wildlife. And I, I essentially have to write that in the in the editing bay. I um, I had a bunch of distributors that were willing to give me the money for the post-production, but they wanted the worldwide rights, and I didn't want to do that, so I waited until I earned the money for, um, I actually had purchased the edit bay, and uh, now it's in post-production, but it's, it's essentially script writing in the editing bay. The original idea was what happens uh, when a action actor goes out into the world to get into the mind of a serial killer, an active shooter. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? So it was sort of a Borat-esque <laughs> exercise. 
what it'll become eventually, I don't really know, but I do know that it, it'll either be brilliant or it won't get released. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of next after uh, Volume 2 polishing uh, to finish Active Shooter. When we started, nobody knew what the word Active Shooter meant. I don't know that it'll be called Active Shooter now because I'm not, you know, I think there's seven projects called Active Shooter yeah. now uh, out in the world. We had to explain it originally. Well, one of my writing mentors used to call every first draft the monster that ate Cleveland because you got to call it something until you find the right title for it eventually. Yeah. Well, we've got a number of big projects that are out there, and I'm very hopeful that they'll find their way to, to the screen. Well, I'm very hopeful that you'll come back and visit us one of these days, Patrick. We've only scratched the surface of your life and career. And uh, in the meantime, Volume 1 of Dying for Living is available through Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, wherever books are sold online. It's available as an audio book through Audible.com. You can follow Patrick on Twitter and on Facebook at I am Pat Kilpatrick. Patrick Kilpatrick, please visit us again on our program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir. You have a great day. Got a product or service that you want our listeners to know about? Become an advertiser or underwriter of TV Confidential and let our brand help promote your brand. For more information, go to televisionconfidential.com forward slash advertise or visit the TV Confidential page at advertisecast.com. Com. Friend Donna Allen Figueroa, who I understand has a new book out. Yes, it's entitled Fall Again Beginnings. It's the first part of a four part contemporary romantic series uh, set against the background of working actors. Something that you know a, little, a thing well, or two well, about. Well, you write what you know, and I have been working in the business for several years. It is not necessarily autobiographical, but it's based on... Sure, many of the experiences that the actors in my book have, many have happened to me, many have happened to friends of mine. It's not, if you're looking for Valley of the Dolls, it's not, it's grounded in reality. It is grounded in reality, and it's the first in a series. Yes, Called the Fall Again series. Fall Again. Which is available as a paperback as well as an ebook and in Kindle at fallagainseries.com. Ed Robertson, along with Benny Biffle and Sammy Schuster, the stars of The Misadventures of Biffle and Schuster. Hey, Benny. Yes, yeah, Sammy. Did you know that there's a new DVD out called The Misadventures of Biffle and Schuster? You're kidding. I thought it was married. I thought it was The Mrs. Adventures no, no, of no, Biffle no, and no, Schuster. No, no, It's single. It's oh, single. It's called The like Misadventures that? of Biffle and Schuster. It's on Kino Lorber. Oh, that's a big company. It is. They only release good stuff. In fact, this came out the same week as The Ten Commandments, the Paramount one that was in color came out. You're kidding. So you know they deal in quality. Yeah. Of course, this one's mostly in black and white, but there is some color in there, as I recall. Right. But the, the movies are colorful in themselves. They certainly are. Mm -hmm. And we work with some wonderful people in there. That's right. And Joe Dante visited us on the set, the great director Joe Dante. What did he say about this collection of shorts? He said something along the lines of, and this is merely a quote, Forehead slapping funny. What impresses is the dogged authenticity to the era, which makes it all the more hilarious, says I, Joe Dante. Joe Dante. How about mm, that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And he's a famous writer. Yes, he is. I wrote about that Inferno thing. He certainly did, yeah. Terrific, yeah. We're Biffle, Biffle and, and Schuster, Schuster, as you can see. No, no one else can make that statement louder than we. we. They say we're soporific and it's probably we. Because we're Biffle and Schuster. Oh, we're Biffle and Schuster. No, no. We're Biffle and Schuster. Whoop. B I W F Biffle Biffle S H W O S T Schuster Biffle and Schuster more. Need we say more? Available wherever DVDs are sold through our friends at Kino Lorber. TV Confidential is available online for listening on demand as a podcast through iTunes, Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else where you could download podcast. You can also listen to recent episodes of TV Confidential On Demand for free on the Listen Now page at televisionconfidential.com.